back in our Father's Word, chapter 11, verse 1, the great book of Joshua. You know, we are conquering the land that God issued to the Israelites that they could call home. And um, how precious it is to know when God is with you. It doesn't matter who's against you. God sees that we have the victory. He has always done that. He always shall. Uh, it is, we can slip and we can pick bad leadership and we can go awry occasionally. But as long as there are Christian-minded people that look to our Heavenly Father and understand who the house of Judah and the house of Israel are, that God blesses them always and provides for us, uh, giving us that victory if we earn it. Okay, chapter 11, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father, and we continue. And it came to pass when Jabin, king of Hazor, had heard those things about how Joshua and the Israelites were taken over, that he sent to Jobab, king of Madon, and to the king of Shimron, and to the king of Aksaph, uh, gathering the crowd together, verse 2, and to the kings that were on the north of the mountains, and to the plains south of Chen. Niraf. This this is Genesaret that Christ would visit many times, most scholars believe. And in the valley and in the borders of Dor on the west. I mean, he's gathering up all that's left. Verse nine, 3, and the Canaanite on the east and on the west, it's both sides of Jordan, and to the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite in the mountains, and the Hivite under Hermon in the land of Mizpah. Mizpah means watchtower, right, right from the, the old high tower overlooking all. You want to remember what's involved in, in part of this grip, the, the group, the Perizzites, uh, Jebusites, and Hivites, uh, Canaanites. Uh, a lot of the old misfits were left over, as we'll find out as, as we continue into this, being the reason God wants the land cleansed. Verse 4, And they went out, and they and all their host with them, much people, they were swarming, even as the sand that is upon the seashore in multitude with horses and chariots, very many. And we, we've got... Still, a, I mean, a huge army coming against these people, these families. Verse 5, And when all these kings were met together, allied, they came and pitched together at the waters of Miron, that's to say this high place uh, where to fight against Israel. Take the high ground always when you make your camp. Good military strategy. But here, we, again, we have Joshua facing, I mean, not just a few, though they have crossed and are making some headway. Here, we, we've got quite an army coming at us. Always remember, though, if God is with you, you've got nothing to fear. You want to always bring God into the equation of your life today, your family, your country, your county, your city, your, especially your place of worship, never leave our Heavenly Father out of the equation. Verse 6, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Be not afraid because of them. I don't care how many they are. Don't be afraid of them. For tomorrow about this time will I deliver them up, all slain before Israel. Thou shalt hold their horses, that this to hamstring them, cut the hamstring, they'll never run again, and burn their chariots with fire. You're, you're going to um, sever the hamstring of even the horses that pull the chariots and destroy them. Uh, uh, this is God's work. And this is why you always want to keep God in the equation. He can make things happen. Verse 7, so Joshua came, and all the people of war with him, against them by the waters 
of Miram suddenly. I mean, they surprised them, had the, the, uh, the uh, surprise in their favor, and they fell upon them. They weren't prepared when Israel was. Verse 8, and the Lord, who did this? The Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel, who smote them, and chased them unto great Zidon, and unto Misphrathmaim, which is to say the place of the salt flats or the flowing waters, and into the valley of Mispah, even the high tower where they first met, eastward, and they smote them until they left them none remaining. They're following up as God had predicted and t uh, issued warning. Verse 9, And Joshua did unto them as the Lord bade him. He hoed their horses and burnt their chariots with fire. He, he disabled them as far as combat was concerned. Ten, and Joshua at that time turned back and took Hazor and smote the king thereof with the sword, for Hazor before time was the head of all these kingdoms, um, of those kingdoms rather. And so it is that he, he chopped off the very head itself and, and uh, annihilated them. Now, wh why, uh, I want to talk for a moment about our Father's righteousness. Why would God allow this to happen? You want to remember there are, within the people that were there, there were many of the hybrids still left from mixing with the fallen angels and the Nethanim and uh, the Nephilim. And, and this is something that God uh, would not have. He was cleansing that land to, to um, take away what Satan had brought upon the land. Now, many would say, then, what is righteous about that? Well, when, when Christ was crucified, and when he first was in the tomb, where do you think he went? He went to paradise. And he preached there, as it is written in Second Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. And many of the people that had no opportunity before believed upon him. I happen to believe that these people also, even though they were, um, had broken every promise and everything that God had ever placed before them, that they had an opportunity to accept truth. Why? Because that's the way our Father is. Never accuse him of being unrighteous, for he always does what is right. I could put it in a little different way. You're always going to get what you got coming to you. And uh, that's why, but at the same time, if you stand with him, he'll take care of your enemies for you, basically, by giving them to you or showing you the way to overcome. Verse 11, to continue. They smote all the souls. That's why, why would it not say bodies here? Because we're talking about eternal souls, nephesh, that were therein with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. There was not any left to breathe. There was no breath of life in them. And he burnt Hazor with fire. He, there was no, nothing left that they could worship or make a, uh, <clears throat> an idol out of. I mean, it was ashes. Verse 12. And all the cities of those kings, and all the kings of them, did Joshua take and smote them with the edge of the sword, and he utterly destroyed them as Moses the servant of the Lord commanded but who commanded Moses? Never read over that. Almighty God commanded Moses, and Joshua, being a servant of Moses or a follower, was completing the task which God had named and enabled the doing thereof coming out the gate. Verse 13. But as for the cities that stood still in their strength, thus behaved themselves. Israel burned none of them, save Hazor only. That did Joshua burn. In other words, those that behaved themselves and those that, uh, that uh, were quiet did not fight. Uh, they, they were left idly by, 14. And all the spoil of these cities, and 
cattle the children of Israel took for a prey unto themselves, but every man they smote with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them, neither left they any to breathe, being what God had commanded. And unfortunately, you want to always remember back what happened to certain people that we call Nethanim, which is a Hebrew word that means given to service, that uh, they would always be with because uh, with the Israel because Israel, through Joshua, had made a promise. And they were to serve and be servants only. The only problem is they began taking over the liturgical duties of the very church itself. And that being the sad affairs as we would note all the way through the book of Ezra and so forth. Verse 15, as the Lord commanded Moses his servant, so did Moses command Joshua, and so did Joshua, he left nothing, nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. Um, he, he, uh, he fulfilled the, the order and the promise. When you bring God into the equation, you listen to him, and you do it God's way, and God will always bless you for that. Verse 16, so Joshua took all that land, the hills, and all the south country, and all the land of Goshen, and the valley, and the plain, and the mountain of Israel, and the valley of the same. I will be showing you a chart in a few days of how this land was allotted and given to the children. Verse 17, even from the Mount um, Halak, th this mount means a, a ball mountain or a smooth top mountain, that goeth up to Seir, even unto Baal Gad, that's where they worship Baal, which is obvious, to the valley of Lebanon, right down to the borders, un, under Mount Hermon, and all their kings he took and smote them and slew them, cleansing that land at the orders of the living God. Verse 18, Joshua made war a long time with all these kings. It didn't happen overnight. It took some time. And... Uh, and, and so it is, 40 years in the wilderness plus, say, another 40 plus in cleansing the land and getting it set aside. Verse 19, to continue. There was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel, save the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon, all other they took in battle. This was the big mistake. This is where the Nethanim came from. You'll remember it back in the earlier chapters where they came in old tattered clothes and, and mildewed food, claiming they had been from a long way away when they were the next door neighbors. And Joshua made this deal with them. And here they were uh, servants, uh, of, again, unfortunately, doing liturgical duty, cutting wood for the fire of the very altar of God. Can you imagine that? But that's one of the weaknesses in all the victories that Joshua was given that he slipped up on. And it was unfortunate because once your word is given, it had to be kept. Verse 20, for it was of the Lord to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle that he might destroy them utterly. Why? Because of, because of the fallen angels. They were unfit. They, they, they were not uh, come by naturally as God's plan so decreed. And, they, and that they might have no favor, but that he might destroy them as the Lord commanded Moses. In other words, um, <clears throat> the hybrids, from the mixing with the fallen angels and so forth, producing geber, that is to say giants, there was some offspring of these still in this area from the second influx. It was God's will that this be destroyed. 
Otherwise, there could never be the innocency that God required in man being born to woman, innocent, a babe. Making his or her own mind up whether they will love Satan or Almighty God. You could not have these supernatural hybrids running around who could remember from before because of the fallen ones, Napa in the Hebrew tongue. And so, therefore, it had to be cleansed. That's difficult for some to understand, but at the same time, if you know the righteousness of our Heavenly Father, it was made right uh, for them, uh, even though it was their parents and others that messed up. God would always give them that opportunity in the millennium or even at the time of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, And at that time came Joshua, and he cut off the Anakims. That's, that's long necks. That means giants. He cut off those giants. And he cut off the Anakims from the mountains, from Hebron and Deborah, from Anab. This is, this is um, a, a, another place where, where they would creep and be. And from all the mountains of Judah. This is where these Geber, giants, long necks, would hang out. And from all the mountains of Israel, Joshua destroyed them utterly with their cities. It was necessary. It was God cleansing the very earth itself. Again, for what reason? So that through the coming of Messiah, we would still have the innocency that is required for true salvation, that is for one to make his or her mind up, who are you going to follow? And, and God wants you totally as an individual to decide that for yourself. He does not wish somebody making that decision for you that might have memory from what happened in the first earth age or to have left their first place of habitation and already be condemned to die. You can read in Jude, uh, the little short book in the New Testament, Jude, before the book of Revelation, in from verse 1 through 6, that to leave your place of habitation, meaning heaven to earth without being born to woman, is a death sentence. They had to be destroyed. Verse 22, there was none of the Anakims, these giants, the second influx, left in the land of the children of Israel, only in Gaza, in Gath, that's the wine press, they're still there. And in Ashdod, there remained. There was still some left there, and regardless of what. And, and certainly, um, this is why that Father's Word is so precious. And it's why those that are wise enough to understand His Word must pay very close attention. I think you're probably noticing that in as much as this is Joshua taking the children into the promised land, that we in this generation are approaching that time when we will enter the promised land. You will notice some of these cities, Gaza and others, are very much in the news today. There's much going on in the Middle East even at this time, the swarm you saw of how large that enemy was, uh, do you think that the locusts are not swarming again? Uh, Lebanon having been mentioned with Hezbollah, Lebanon. You know, many of these things come to forth and should jump out at you. Even if I do not mention them as we go along, they should be fresh in your mind that you can run the comparison for as you would read in the very first chapter of the great book of Ecclesiastes that tells you how to find happiness in these flesh bodies, it lets you know what has been will be again. What goes around comes around. God said, this is the way I teach you. It happened before. All you have to do is look at it and run a comparison and you will know what will befall you. And, and so it is. Um, Again, that's reiterated in the very first chapter of the great book of Ecclesiastes. Um, 
That's God's method of teaching. You can even follow through on that in the, in the New Testament, where you would read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, these things happen, this Joshua, the Genesis, all through, these things happen whereby you would know what would befall us in, at the end of the world. So that, that's why you have to pay close attention, because what goes around comes around. So here we have conquered, but always left that little part there. Gath is where the wine press is. That's what the word means, wine press. That, um, that uh, where, where the very grape itself is squeezed and crushed. We, we leave an enemy. Verse 23, to continue, bear those things in mind. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord said unto Moses, following that in detail. And Joshua gave it for an inheritance unto Israel, according to their divisions by their tribes, and the land rested from war. In, in the next lecture, I will show you a, a, a map of the allotment and how it was issued to both the house of Judah and the house of Israel, which they were all one house at the time of this writing, and, and how precious it is that God continues his work. You know, God had a master plan coming out the gate. When he destroyed the first earth age because of Satan's rebellion and a third of his children following him, he set this earth age in motion. He arranges it when you bring him into the equation so that your trip through this flesh age has a destiny and a purpose. How do you know and how do you find it? From the Word of God, of course. That's why Joshua, taking them into the promised land, Joshua being Yeshua in the Hebrew tongue, which is the same name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he was a type of Savior. And that's how that God will save his children. So pay very close attention. Chapter 12, verse 1. Now, these are the kings of the land which the children of Israel smote. A lot of this is redundant. That's okay. And possessed their land on the other side of Jordan toward the rising of the sun. Well, which way is it toward the rising of the sun? That would be the east, from the river Arnon unto Mount Hermon and all the plain on the east. And, of course, this would be given to Reuben, as I will show you in the next lecture, and to half, uh, to, that into the half-tribe of Manasseh. <clears throat> Verse 2, Sihon, king of the Amorites, who dwelt in Heshbon, and ruled from Aurora, uh, which is upon the bank of the river Arnon, and from the middle of the river, and from the ha from half Gilad, even into the river Jabbok, which is the border of the children of Ammon, and dividing it up. Don't don't get. We'll, we'll sh again. I will be showing you a a picture map so that you can just understand this better in the next lecture. Verse 3, and from the plain to the sea of Chinaroth, which, which is um, Genesaret, which Jesus would spend so much time with and at on the east, and into the sea of the plain, even to the salt sea, that it would be the Dead Sea, okay, on the east, the way to Beth Jeshemoth, that, that is to say the, um, the house of the desert, uh, and from the south un under um, Ashdoth's Pishka. Uh, and, and so it is that uh, time marches on and God makes arrangements. Verse 4, and the coast of Og, there's that old giant again, the coast of Og, king of Bashan, which was of the remnant of the giants, still there, that dwelt at Ashtaroth and at Edrei, which is uh, 
means stronghold. He had a stronghold. Everything, uh, Bashan, had a, Bashan had a reputation of even the wild ox were huge there. Everything was huge, and here in part, you can understand why. It's where Og in that second influx took over and where he was, the giants of that time. And, and here, if you're a realist, you can understand why God intended that this be cleansed whereby a people could be set in motion that loved him, mostly that obeyed him, and followed him to, and uh, brought in salvation even to those that were enemies of Almighty God to bring them into light, ultimately. Uh, we, we are not judges, but our Father is, and our Father knows how he judges. And, and so it is that he brings things to pass. And, and to some it would be a mystery. But when you understand what breaking God's commandment that breaks the uh, opportunity for innocency, such as the Nephilim coming down and producing Og, which puts in mind they're not innocent anymore. They know what that sin was. They know what happened there. They are unclean. And, and it breaks God's plan of innocency and true love for his children and it must be fixed. It, there, there must and will be a change. Uh, verse 5, And reigned in Mount Hermon and in Shalcut and in all Bashan, all the land of Og there, under the border of Jeshurites, uh, the Jeshurites, and the Maacathites, and half Gilead, the brother of Sihon, king of Heshbon. And here, unfortunately, from Gilead, we have uh, uh, <coughs> part of these people from Gibeon as well. Still got them with us. Why? Because Joshua messed up. And um, <coughs> so you always have that to deal with. Is it good? It's good for us to have the knowledge to understand that you have to pay attention to what Almighty God teaches in the way he leads us and instructs us. Again, you may think these things are not important. Many of these names, if I were to describe the geographical location, which we will in the next lecture, you see many things transpiring there today that you will read and hear in the news every day of events transpiring there and many of them matching what was happening here, basically. We're not entering that promised land yet. Not going there. God has given us new lands, the house of Judah, the house of Israel, separate. And how precious it is. Verse 6, Then did Moses, the servant of the Lord, and the children of Israel smite, and Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave it for a possession unto Reubenites, and the Gadites into a half tribe of Manasseh. Well, which, which was that again? Well, we go through it. That's east of the Jordan. That's before they ever crossed over Jordan, that uh, this land was taken and it was given to Reuben, the Gadites, and a half of the tribe of Manasseh, where they settled their families there, and they would be the lead or shock troops that were leading the attack when they crossed Jordan their wives and children would remain on east of the Jordan, that is to say of the Gadats, Reuben, and half-tribe of Manasseh, but they would go help the brothers take over their land, which is being described here. Our Father always has a perfect plan. You might see how Moses is brought back into this. This is who God gave the original order. Joshua is following it, uh, following it through to the letter as Moses had commanded. Moses, uh, as we read in the last few verses of the book of Deuteronomy, last chapter, there will never be another prophet like Moses. Moses has not finished his work. Moses will still complete his work, the same as Elijah will. 
But here we have these records that keep us posted and keep us informed that are very pertinent even to this day. Verse 7, And these are the kings of the country which Joshua and the children of Israel smote on this side Jordan, on the west. This is to cross over the Jordan all the way down to the tribe of Judah, the furthest to the south. And Baal Al Gad in the valley, Baal Gad in the valley of Lebanon, even into the Mount Halak that goeth up to Seir, which Joshua gave unto the tribes of Israel for a possession according to their divisions, according to the twelve tribes, as they were divided among the land. It was conquered. It is too bad that we still have part that remain, that Gath, and Gath is way down south. Gath, Gath is very near, or, or off a ways from Gaza, and from the shoreline there where Nathan and his four virgin daughters taught during the New Testament time. All these things pertinent and, and important that we should hang on to. One more verse to go, verse 8. In the mountains, and in the valleys, and in the plains, and in the springs, and in the wilderness, and in the south country, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, where there were still many fallen ones and mixed hybrids, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And of course, the Jebusites would have been the one that founded uh, um, uh, Jebus, which would later become Jerusalem. And so it was. In the next lecture, we will <coughs> skip from here to chapter 13 because it is just repetition, and I will take you to a map of sometime during that lecture, the next one, laying this out whereby you can see for yourself the lay of the land and the home of the 12 tribes of Israel. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please?